Hey everybody, thank you for joining us today for morning prayer. Thank you for joining me for this reflection. I'm Ed Trevers, but you probably already know that. Straight up, uh, you know, full disclosure, just before watching this, I ended up watching a, a uh, Reverend William Barber sermon, so I'm feeling kind of pumped. So let's see where this takes us. Today we're going to be talking about the John the Baptist story in the first chapter of the Gospel of St. John. And in this story, what we hear is, we hear about John, John the Baptist baptizing people on the River Jordan. We hear a little bit about who he is. And then we hear about these Pharisees coming by. And, and they're there, and they're, they want to know what he's doing. They want to make sure that he is not a threat. They want to make sure that, that he's not a threat to their authority. I mean, as we talked about last week, maybe the week before, you know, through Jesus Christ, there is no barriers between us and God. Well, the Pharisees were the legalists. They were the, they were the religious authorities at that time. And when they hear about John the Baptist out in the, out in the River Jordan, they're not there really to ask, you know, is he, are you doing good things? Tell us what God says to you. They're there to make sure that John the Baptist doesn't overstep. They're there to make sure that John the Baptist doesn't do something or say something that undermines their authority with the people. They want the people to understand perfectly well that the Pharisees are the way to God. They want the people to understand perfectly well that the Pharisees, the religious leaders, are the conduits to God. They want the people to understand perfectly well that it is the Pharisees who are going to lead them to God, who are going to keep them with God. That without the Pharisees, God is going to be angry and God is never going to communicate with the people. And so when they start questioning John, they ask him that first question, are you the Messiah? He understands full well what this means. And for two reasons, he says no. The first is he's not the Messiah and he knows it. He's not there to save anybody. He's not there to be the conduit. He's there to share a message. And the second reason is he knows it'll cost him his life. He says he's the Messiah. He's dead the next day. Nope, I'm not the Messiah. And so they ask him, are you Elijah? Nope. Elijah is supposed to be the precursor to the Messiah. He's not Elijah. He's not a metaphor for Elijah. He's not a symbol for Elijah. He's John. And he is there for Jesus. So then they ask him, who are you? What do you have to say about yourself? And he says, I am the voice of one crying out, in the wilderness make straight the ways of the Lord. And at this, then they start questioning why exactly he's baptizing. And he gives them the answers that he sort of tells them what we talked about last week in last week's sermon, that he's there to help people repent, to help people change direction in life, to help people let go of, of their behaviors and their attitudes, to let go of their guilt, to let go of their shame, and, and, and to walk a new life. Now, oftentimes, the church has taken this passage, and this is where the, the, the thoughts of the Pharisees have sort of seeped back into, into the teachings of Christianity, into the, the general premise of Christianity. There's this sense that when he says, uh, you know, make straight the ways of the Lord, that what we are supposed to do is we are supposed to prepare ourselves for Jesus. We're supposed to prepare ourselves for Jesus' message. We're supposed to prepare ourselves for Jesus' love. We're supposed to prepare ourselves for Jesus' intervention in our life, for, for his teaching, for his coaching, for, for whatever it is you, you, you want to you call it. And that's true. But not in the way we've generally approached it or applied it. Christianity is supposed to be Christocentric. Christ is the center of this religion. He's the center of our faith. He is the be all and end all. It is through him that we are able to find our way to God. Christ, Christianity is supposed to be Christocentric about Christ, Christ at the center. And yet what we do with this passage, we say, okay, we got to prepare, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the ways of the Lord, level ground. You got to get right with the Lord. You got to make sure that when the Lord comes, he's going to love you. 
You got to make sure that when, that when you got your, yourself in order, you got yourself in balance, you got yourself in check, you're not sinning no more, you're not doing any of that bad stuff because when the Lord comes, he's going to be angry with you if you're not, if you're not perfect, if you're not ready. And that's just not true. As a matter of fact, when we apply that kind of teaching to Christianity, Christianity loses its Christocentric nature and it actually becomes humanistic. And this is probably going to get me in trouble with, with some Christian ministers. But any time in Christianity when we say we have a responsibility to get ourselves right with God because that will mean God will love us more or God will love us less, right? That depending on how good we are, we are loved more or less. We are making this about ourselves. Ed, you got to be a better person. Okay, I'll be a better person and God will love me more. Well, who am I worshiping in that moment? I'm worshiping me. Right, Ed, you got to, you got to, you got to stop drinking. You got to stop drugs. You got to stop womanizing. You got to stop swearing. Bo's wife. You got to stop whatever. Okay, well, that means I'm, I'm, I'm pretty focused on me. That means I'm worshiping me. That means I'm the center of this religion. And if you ever wonder where Christianity went off the rails, it's because we made it about ourselves instead of about Christ. Because no matter what I do, no matter how good I am, no matter how perfect I am, no matter how much I stop doing the things that I'm not supposed to do, that is going to have absolutely zero impact on how much God loves me. John's call to make ways, to make straight the ways of the Lord was not about getting yourselves right so that when Jesus comes, you will be loved by God. You will be able to be saved. That's like saying, I'm going to get in shape before I go to the gym. Right? It doesn't work that way. You go to the gym to get in shape. Jesus was coming to get us in shape. Jesus was coming to do the work. Jesus was coming to, 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 to build that path to God for us. John's message, make straight the ways of the Lord, is not about us doing things to be loved, to be loved more, to be loved less. It was John saying, make straight the ways of the Lord so that you can receive this message of love. So that you can receive it. Not so that God will have it, not so that you can have God's love, but so that you can receive God's love because God's love is perfect and perfectly full and for you. But sometimes we're not ready to receive it. We're not able to hear that message. Make straight the ways of the Lord. It's not about getting your house in order. It's about opening your heart to receive a message that says, God loves you unconditionally, perfectly, and fully. God's message that we hear through Jesus Christ is that you are never alone, even though you may not see another human being around you. You are never alone. God's message is about you are good enough just as you are. God has decided to cross the boundary. God has decided to come to you. You are good enough just as you are. All we have to be able to do is to receive it. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and I pray that you will always know the peace of being in the Lord's presence. And I pray that no matter what anybody tells you, you understand perfectly that God loves you perfectly, unconditionally, and fully, just as you are, all the time. Amen.